Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. Good morning. Whether we realize it or not, we are all in a war. We are all in a spiritual battle in which God is our commander. We are fellow soldiers and the devil and his servants are our enemies. You see, the devil is a real being. There are those who have the idea that the devil is is really just the embodiment of all evil in the world and that maybe he's not really a, a real being but rather just he sort of represents all of the evil that exists in the world but the bible puts forth the idea that the devil is is indeed a real being and in the passage which was just read for us in first peter 5 and verse 8 peter warns us to be sober and vigilant why because we have an adversary who is the devil walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It is the devil's goal. It is the devil's aim. It is his purpose to destroy us. That is what he wants to do. In any warfare, one needs tools. Anytime you have a task to complete, it always helps to have the right tools. I have often gone to others for help in car repairs. And one of the reasons I don't often try it on my own is because I don't have the right tools. And a job that might take Bobby 10 minutes would take me literally two or three hours because he has the tools and the knowledge and can accomplish it very quickly. There are other individuals who can do a lot with very simple tools. At various times I've had Dan Cuneo help me with different things and he can do just about anything with a screwdriver. <laughs> Whether he's helped me with working on a car or installing electric in our house, whatever it might be, it seems like he always says, give me a screwdriver and he can get the job done. Well, the devil and his goal and his purpose, he has some tools that he can use. Tools that are very effective, tools that are suited to the task of causing us to either never become a Christian, or if we already are a Christian, causing us to become unfaithful. Now, he can't force us to do anything, but he certainly has tools that he can use to influence us to become unfaithful to our Heavenly Father. Now God, we will say this at the beginning, God provides us with armor for this warfare. And we could and have in the past talked about the Christian armor. In, first, or excuse me, in Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Some of the songs that we've sung this morning have talked about uh, being Christian soldiers, have talked about the fact that we're in a warfare and we ought to not yield to temptation. God has given us tools to use to resist the temptations the devil has placed before us, not the least of which is his word, which we know Paul, David said in Psalm 119, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at some of the tools that the devil uses in order to either A, cause us or influence us never to become a Christian, or number two, if you are a Christian, he's trying to get you to become unfaithful to our Lord. Now this is a two-parter. We're going to look at three this morning, and we're going to look at three more this evening of the tools that the devil uses uh, in his quest to cause us to be lost. The first one we're going to notice is deception. Deception is one of the 
One of the tools that the devil uses. One of the, if, if you were to ask, what is the defining characteristic of the devil? Jesus tells us that certainly one of his defining characteristics is his deceitfulness. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, he tells the Jews of his day, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The father of lies is how Jesus describes the devil. What does he mean, father of lies? Well, he was the originator. He was the first one who ever told a lie. And if you remember the account in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, he lied to Eve when he told Eve, if you eat of that tree, he said, you shall not surely die. As we've said before, he only added one word to what God had said. For God had said, you shall surely die. And he says, you shall not surely die. And so he lied to Eve, and in doing that, influenced her to be unfaithful to God. One of the ways that the devil lies to us in regard to sin is he makes us think that whatever the sin is, it will make us happier. And he definitely does not want us to think about the consequences that might come down the line. He wants us to seek and look for the immediate gratification that you will have from sin. And he doesn't want you to think about all the bad that could happen and that will happen later on. You don't have to go very far after Adam and Eve. We have uh, the devil lying to Cain. Now we don't actually have an account of the devil talking to Cain like we do with uh, Eve and the devil. But I, he convinces the devil that if he killed his brother, evidently it would make him happy. And we know, of course, that he most likely did not think about the consequences that would come as a result of that. In Genesis 4, verses 10 to 13, God is speaking to Cain. He says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So here are the consequences. Now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And, the Lord, and Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Certainly when he killed his brother, he was not thinking about the punishment that was going to come as a result of that disobedience to God. And that certainly is the way that the devil works. He wants us to focus in on the immediate gratification that we might obtain from that sin, but does not want us to think about uh, the future consequences. Sin, by its very nature, is deceitful in that way. We're warned about the deceitfulness of sin in Hebrews 3 and verse 13, where the writer tells us, Exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest you, any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How is it that sin is so deceitful? Well, as we've said, it promises happiness. But that joy, unfortunately, is short-lived. And then you have to live with the consequences of the action that you have committed. And that joy then is long gone, but the consequences will linger on. You, you remember the story of David in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're not going to uh, go back there and read about all of that, but chapter 11 of 2 Samuel deals with his sin with Bathsheba. You see, the devil convinced David that he just had to be with Bathsheba, that his life would be so much better if he was with Bathsheba. And we ask, did David at that time stop to think about all the, the consequences that this sin would bring about? He didn't know that this sin, this one, what we might say, one little sin, was going to actually lead him to down the line commit murder in order to try to hide his sin with Bathsheba. He, he didn't think about any of that. He was focused upon the immediate gratification, satis, uh, satisfaction of his urges, 
And as a result, he did not think of the future consequences. The devil still works that way today. He still uses deception. He wants us to focus on the immediate gratification and not think about the future. He tells people, for example, that alcohol, you know, alcohol will take away your problems. You just drink enough of this alcohol and your senses will be dulled and things will all be better. And we know, of course, that that is not true. That again, there may be a temporary relieving of the suffering, but that does not take away the problem and its causes. And the scriptures warn us about this in Proverbs 23, 31 and 32. Solomon says, do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. You see the word of God again. We hide it in our heart. If we make it a part of our lives, it can help us resist temptations. The devil lies and says alcohol will make it better. Drugs will make it better. But it certainly does not. He still tells people that fornication is fine. After all, God wants you to be happy, right? And we hear that all of the time. And we hear things like, well, everybody does it. You know, waiting until you get married in order to have sexual relations. Nobody does that now. Everybody just, you know, gets married in due time. But the scriptures still warn us about fornication and the fact that fornication is sin and will cause us to be lost. In Proverbs 2, again, Solomon writing to his son, he says, to, de uh, to deliver you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who, who flatters with her <laughs> words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house leads down to death and her paths to the dead. So he's talking about or warning his son about going to the seductress. And we're applying this to us today in the sense of fornication in general. That path leads to death, spiritual death and separation from God. He also tells people today that more money will make their lives better. If you just had more money, your life will be so much better. And yet the scriptures warn us time and again of the dangers of money and specifically the love of money the richest man who probably ever lived wrote in ecclesiastes 5 10 through 12 he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver nor he who loves abundance with increase this is also vanity why solomon when goods increase they increase who eat them so what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? The sleep of the laboring man, he's contrasting here, the sleep of the laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. And so the scriptures warn us again that riches aren't all they're cut out to be. All you need to do is, is read the newspaper or, or look, in the, look in the news. I don't know if anybody reads newspapers anymore. But look in the news and you'll see that money does not make people happy. As a matter of fact, some of the most miserable people you'll ever meet are very wealthy people. They don't have the same problems that poor people have. They have a different set of problems, as Solomon said. But you, nevertheless, it doesn't bring them happiness. And so we're warned in the scriptures by Paul in 1 Timothy 6 and 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He also, down in verses 9 and 10, warns that uh, if we seek after those things, if we seek after riches and they are our primary goal in life, it's going to lead to heartache. Notice, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. For which many have strayed from the faith, piercing themselves through with many sorrows. And so the scriptures warn us that riches won't make things better, won't make you a happier individual. But yet the devil shows us stars and movie theater, or movie stars and, and athletes or wealthy businessmen. And he points to those people and, and he tells us that those people are the definition of success in this life. And that simply is not true. You see, the devil doesn't want us to understand or read passages like Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. 
Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. So the devil uses deception. He, he encourages us to partake of the worldly sinful things around that surround us and, and wants us to believe that those things will make us happier. And he certainly does not want us focusing on the consequences down the line, uh, which will eventually lead to us being lost. So deception is one of the devil's tools. Number two, distraction. Distraction. You see, the devil knows that God requires top priority in our lives. He demands and deserves to be number one. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Jesus says that love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Over in Luke 14 and 33, he says, likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has, Cannot be my disciple. All of these things just go to show that God wants to be first in our lives. And the devil knows that God is a jealous God. Remember when God delivered the Ten Commandments or delivered the law to Moses and the children of Israel. In Exodus chapter 20 verses 4 and 5. He says you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Now, uh, again, let's realize that this carved image, these are idols or false gods, and we today can have any type of idol or false god, uh, whether it be money or fame or popularity, whatever it might be. But he says, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Why? He says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. A jealous God. He doesn't want us worshiping or loving anything or anyone more than we love him. So the devil knowing that, all he really has to do is distract us from fully committing ourselves to God. He just has to find some way to take up our time, to take up our energy and distract us from fully committing ourselves to the service of God. Let me suggest there are many activities that we get involved with that in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with them. There are various hobbies or sports or maybe outdoor activities or school activities or clubs or things that we can get involved in that inherently there's nothing wrong with any of those activities. There's nothing sinful involved with them. But all the devil has to do, though, is use those good activities to keep you so busy that you don't have any time to serve God and he's won. He's used the tool of distraction to distract you from what was most important. Your service to almighty God in heaven. You see when we allow ourselves to be distracted in that way in many ways we're like the children of Israel. Who when they came back from captivity... They allowed God's house, the temple, to go unfinished because they were so distracted. They were so busy building their own homes and dwelling in their own homes to work on the house of God, the temple. When we overcommit our time, we often end up shortchanging God. We're so busy doing other things that we have no time for the work of the church. We don't do the work of the church. We don't take part in the different ministries that this church has going. We don't um, take advantage of the fellowship opportunities that the church has because we're so busy doing these other things. And we forget that there is no more important work than the work of the church. You see, we also forget when we allow this to happen that two are better than one. And that God designed the church the way that he did is because, because we can accomplish more together than we can alone. And we're reminded of what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 4, beginning at verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. I think there he's saying two are better than one because you can get more done. 
You can't do that if, if one of the two is too busy out playing whatever, golf or, you know, whatever it might be to do the work of the church. I'm not picking on our elders. I know they play golf. But um, we can't do that. But going on, if they fall, one will lift up his companion. Woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. And so also involved in that is the idea of, of helping one another when we fall, when we become discouraged. And he says, again, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. We're stronger together. We often forget that when we overcommit ourselves and we commit to do other things rather than God's work. And we save no time for God. But the devil doesn't forget. It's his job. It's his purpose to make sure that. When it comes time to do the work of the church, the few faithful are going to be alone. They're going to be in the minority because others are going to be too busy doing other things to spend time in service to their Lord. And so the devil uses distraction to keep us from being as committed as we ought to be. We need to remember that sins of omission are just as bad as sins of commission. Commission being when we do something we shouldn't. We know that's wrong. We know that it's wrong to lie or to steal. But oftentimes we forget or overlook the fact or maybe we willfully forget that not doing what we're commanded, a sin of omission, is just as wrong and can cause us to be lost just as quickly. Let us, when we plan our time, when we plan our schedule, we all have the same amount of time in the day. Put God first and say, I'm going to devote such and such amount of time to Bible study, to doing the work of the church, and then other things come after. Don't allow the devil to lead you astray through distraction. And then number three, the devil uses deception. He uses distraction and keeping with my theme of D words, he uses dilution. Dilution. What do I mean by dilution? To dilute something is to make it thinner or weaker by adding water. Okay, so how is dilution a tool of the devil? He tries to get people to commit to a watered down version of Christianity. He tries to get people to commit to a watered down version of Christianity. And so I have some examples. Um, of what I mean by watered down Christianity. Number one, faith only Christianity. This type of Christianity says that as long as you believe in God and that uh, Jesus is his son, you're fine. They argue there's no work, or I should say obedience, that is required for salvation on our part. Many times individuals who believe in faith only Christianity also hold to the doctrine of once saved, always saved. It's a false doctrine that says that once you become a Christian, you'll always be a Christian because no work is required. And that includes obedience to the commands of God. So if you're saved, you're always saved. You see, the devil knows that faith without works is dead. And so he wants a person to commit to a faith-only type of Christianity. We remember the, the warning of James in James 2, 14 through 20. He says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Well, he's going to give it, he's going to answer that question. Can faith alone save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give him the things which are needed to the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, notice if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, but I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well, but even the demons believe and tremble. Or do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So the devil knows. If I can get this individual to commit to a church, to a group that believes faith only, I got him. 
Because faith only is vain. It's worthless. It takes obedience on my part as well in order to be saved from my sins. And so he dilutes Christianity a little bit there and neglects the fact that works are also needed or obedience are also needed for salvation. Then there the, there's the other extreme, a works only Christianity, a works only. This version of Christianity is the one that, you know, if you just do enough good works, surely you're going to be fine. Surely if you do good and help your fellow man, God is not going to condemn you to an eternity of punishment and separation from him. These folks generally believe that you don't need to be a member of the church or of any church. They believe it's not necessary to assemble with other Christians in order to worship God. And so they just live by the idea that if I just do good, if I'm a good person and help others, God would never condemn me to be lost. And so this is a works only type of Christianity. The devil knows, however, that uh, no amount of work in the world will wash away a single sin. Notice Titus 3 verses 4 and 5. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's only the blood of Jesus that can wash away sin. And we have to obey the gospel in order to access that blood. Remember also Colossians 1 verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through good works. Well, it doesn't really say that, does it? We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't say if you do enough good, you're going to have redemption. It doesn't work that way. Again, we're not negating obedience. The scriptures teach obedience is necessary. But in order to be forgiven, it takes humble submission to the will of God. And just doing good works does not wash away sins. Why? Because it does not put you into contact with the blood of Christ. So there is the works only. There is the faith only. There's also another diluted version of Christianity. I'm, I'm calling it the stay at home Christianity. The stay at home. These folks profess to be Christians. Um, but they do all of their work and all of their worship at home. Now, let me say right now, if a brother or sister is unable to get out of the home to do the work and worship of the church, then surely God will accept whatever they can do from their home. So I'm not talking about the individual who is unable for physical reasons or whatever to get out of the home to do the work of the church. I'm referring to the person who is able to get out and to take part in the work of the church and to take part in the assembly, and yet they choose not to. So this person who practices stay-at-home Christianity is the one who chooses to practice the, their Christianity in the privacy of their own home. They have basically no interaction with other Christians. They're practicing a watered-down version of Christianity, and I think... Many of us probably know people like this. They profess to be Christians. If you talk to them about Jesus, they'll say, I'm a Christian. But yet they never leave the home on Sunday morning to go to a worship service. They, never, they are not even usually associated with any specific church whatsoever. You see, the devil knows that God requires his servants to assemble together and to work together and encourage one another. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so the devil knows if I can just convince this person you can be a Christian in the privacy of your own home and never go out, never take part in any of the, any works of the church, you'll be okay. How many of us have heard people say, well, I watch, I watch a preacher on Sunday morning. Again, if that's all you can do, that's fine. 
But a as a substitute for pure Christianity, it it's not enough. It's not what God desires. Number, what is this? Number four, undercover Christianity. Undercover Christianity. These are the Christians who are too afraid to speak out to others about Jesus. They're afraid of the response that they might get. They're afraid of not being able to answer objections. So they decide they're just going to lead the Christian life. Minus the evangelistic side of the Christian life. And hope that maybe someday one of their friends or co-workers might show some interest. And so these are undercover Christians because they're fearful. And the devil knows that ashamed Christians... Or afraid Christians are lost Christians. Because we remember the words of Jesus. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him. The son of man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy <coughs> angels. And then number five. The compromising form of Christianity. The compromising Christianity. These are the Christians who refuse to take a stand for truth. In order to avoid conflict and uncomfortable situations, they compromise the teachings of Scripture. They compromise God's plan of salvation. They compromise God's plan for worship. They compromise God's plan for the organization of the church. And the devil knows that a Christian who is a compromising Christian, who is unwilling to stand for the truth, is a lost Christian. Ephesians 5 and verse 11. Uh oh. I skipped one. 2 John 10 and verse 11. No. second. I did the same thing John did. 2 John verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine. Do not receive him into your houses nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deed. If we don't stand for the truth. In essence we're standing for error. We're standing for that which is not true. And so the devil knows this. He knows that compromising Christians are lost Christians. And so he encourages people to commit to a weakened, a watered down form of Christianity. Faith only, works only, stay at home, undercover, whatever it might be. Um, these watered down versions of Christianity lead that individual to feel like they're probably okay when in essence they're not. Three of the tools that the devil uses. He uses deception, he uses distraction, and he uses dilution. Tonight we're going to talk about three other tools that the devil uses. As we conclude though our lesson for this morning, we, all, we want to encourage each and every one of you to realize the devil is real, and he, he wants us all to be lost. All of us, the scriptures tell us, have sin in our lives. Therefore, we have to come to Christ through obedience to his will in order to have our sins washed away. They're washed away by the blood of Christ. We already read that. But how do we come into contact with that blood? Well, when Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, he, he came to believe in Jesus. And that's the first step. To becoming a Christian. He also expressed a desire to repent. He says Lord what do you want me to do? He wanted to quit doing what was wrong. And start doing what was right. You could argue he even confessed Jesus. When he said Lord. What do you want me to do? He, he acknowledged verbally his belief. That Jesus was the Lord. But yet he goes into Damascus. And, and he, he continues to pray. And wait for someone to be sent to teach him. After a few days go by, Ananias comes and tells him, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It was at the point of baptism that his sins were washed away. And so if the blood of Jesus washes away my sins, and baptism is what causes my sins to be washed away, how do I come into contact with the blood of Jesus? By obedience to the gospel, which includes being baptized or immersed. That the blood of Jesus washes away my sins. The devil doesn't want you to know that. The devil wants you to think you're okay. You don't need to obey the gospel. But if you have not done that yet. We encourage you to do that. God encourages you to do that. Sin is in your life. Don't deceive yourself into thinking you're okay. 
until you obey the gospel. Many of us, not most of us, have obeyed the gospel, but maybe the devil is using some of these tools and the temptation to sin in our lives. He never gives up on us, and some have even said, and I think it's right, the devil works harder on Christians because he has everybody else. So he's been working on us. Maybe as a Christian, you've given in to some of the tools of the devil. And you've allowed yourself to wander away from the truth. And you're no longer living as a Christian should. Know that God will always bring you back and accept you back. If you're like that prodigal son that we read about in Luke 15. Who repents and returns. If you repent of the sin in your life and and return to the Father. He'll take you back. So as we are about to sing the invitation song. If there are any who need to respond. We encourage you to make the decision to do so. Don't put it off or procrastinate, but rather do it this morning. Please come while we're standing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.